Welcome to UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center uh, for our evening lecture on the avian summer visitors to Tahoe. Um, we run a sort of monthly lecture series here and as summer kicks in in Tahoe, we have three actually planned for July. Uh, the first one after this is a climate and crisis lecture on July 10th. Then we're going to do a Bear Aware Community Forum on July 18th, followed by a Nutrition and Sugar Risk Factor Lecture on July 26th. So all of those can be found on our website, and you're welcome to sign up to receive updates and flyers in your email. Um, my name is Nicole Shaw. I'm the Program Coordinator for Turk and the Tahoe Science Consortium, so welcome. Um, and I'd like to say, first, uh, there will be a follow-up to this lecture on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. at the Tahoe City location at Lake Forest Drive and Highway 28 um, for a bird watching walk. So with that, I'd like to introduce Kirk Hardy, the co-director of the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science and adjunct faculty at Santa Nevada College. So welcome. Great, well thanks everyone for coming out tonight. And, um, I just lost my control of the computer, but Tonight's talk is Tahoe Avian Summer Visitors, and I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm going to give you the clicker. But just a brief outline of, to fully appreciate the birds that come to Tahoe in the summer, we need to have a basic understanding of migration. So we'll cover a little bit about migration, uh, and then we'll get into some examples of our local birds here that are just visiting for the summer, uh, and then talk about a couple events that we also have coming up. So, oh, you have a clicker. Awesome. Uh, Yay! Something worked. <laughs> <laughs> We're having some problems with the audio, so hopefully the audio works for some of the bird calls I have. We'll see that. Um, first up, what is migration? And most of the time when we think of migration, it's seasonal migration. There's, migration is a very complex uh, thing. It's, there's a lot of variation, and you know, people tend to think of uh, migration as their spring migration. Everything was north in the spring and then south in the fall. And actually, there's migration happening the entire year, um, year round with birds. So there's not really a, a stopping point or a starting point for it. It just depends on the species. Um, but the, for our uh, uses tonight, migration will mean movement from wintering grounds to breeding grounds and back again. So something that's seasonal, we can predict that it's going to happen every year. And, or I just said it happens every year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for our seasonal migrants, they usually happen along predictable routes. So if we take this peregrine falcon here, you can see the blue lines with the arrows pointing up are where they migrate north from South America. The red lines are them migrating back south. And they, you know, a lot of times they do follow the same line, but occasionally they'll pick a different route. But and there's a maps that a National Geographic have. They're just way too complex to put up here, but it, it, if you ever get a chance to look at it, it shows you the diversity of migration routes. But there's a lot of birds that migrate up the west coast, a lot that go up the Rockies, and then a lot that move across the Midwest and into the east coast. So a lot of migration happens. So why do birds migrate? Well, there's more benefit to them migrating than not migrating. And the main reason they're migrating is for reproduction. They have better chances of successfully raising their young if they come to these northern latitudes, the temperate zones, away from the tropics. And the reason for that is we have abundant resources here. So this is supposed to be my example of migration, and this is supposed to be my example of bugs. <laughs> um, it's hard to get a picture of small, lots of small bugs to really appreciate, but um, if you imagine going out into a meadow right now up here in Tahoe, they're wet, and there's lots of insects and other bugs flying around. The summertime, we have a lot of insects, which provides a lot of food for most of our migrants. So those birds are coming north to take advantage of that food source, and then when the food source is gone, they take off. But I'll get more into that too. Um, so why don't they stay through the winter? Well, it's a lack of food for a lot of them. Like, you know, a, a lot of people tend to think of migration as getting away from something, when actually it's more going towards something. Their food source is no longer available, so they're taking off. The winter snowstorms that we get up here, we don't have as many insects. They're taking off. But think about a duck in the Midwest. He needs to be on a lake to find the insects or the vegetation he's eating. If it freezes over, 
his food source is gone. So that's why things are moving around, is that they really don't have their food source anymore. You know, as opposed to, uh, we do have birds, about 60 species or so, that stick around the Tahoe Basin in the winter. And that varies on how uh, bad or like, oh, how, uh, if there's a lot of snow that winter, if it's really cold, there's fewer birds. But if it's a mild winter, this winter wasn't too bad, so some things stuck around. But our mountain chickadee here, it's insects like a lot of our migrants, but he sticks around because he has a strategy of um, eating insects, the larvae that they lie, lay inside pine needles is one of his food sources in the wintertime. So some birds can find it, but the main thing is there's not enough food for all the birds to go around. So some of them take off to go find food elsewhere. And some other reasons. Um, in the tropics, there's a high density of a lot of things. Um, predators. There's lots of snakes. I found this great example of a snake eating an egg there. Uh, there's snakes. There's a lot more rodents. There's a lot of predators, uh, other birds. Um, lots of things that can get into a nest and eat the young. There's also a lot of parasites. I mean, think about all those shots and things you have to get to go to a tropical region. Well, there's a lot more of those things that show up inside nests as well. But one of the biggest things is competitors. When, in uh, North America, when North America being the United States and Canada, we have over 900 species of birds here. If we go down to Costa Rica and Central America, a country the size of West Virginia, there's over 900 species of birds just in Costa Rica. So there's a lot more birds in a smaller place in the tropics. So they get away, and they actually have a better chance of raising their young up here than those birds that stay in Costa Rica to raise their young. But another advantage that our birds up here have are longer days. And longer days mean they can forage for food longer, so they can find more food to feed their young. So you know, in the tropics of Costa Rica, you know, there's maybe a half hour difference between winter hours and summer hours. But up here, we go in from, what is it, like nine hours of light to, say, 14, 15 hours of light. So they have a lot longer time to be searching for food to feed those hungry young. And just a, another thing about migration is we tend to think of migration as north to south. That's a lot of our tropical migrants are doing that pattern, north, south, and then back again. But there's also west and east. Um, our bald eagles actually will migrate northwest, and, anyways, and ducks will actually migrate from the Midwest in the winter to the coasts in the summertime. Or actually, I had that backwards. <laughs> from the coasts in the winter to the Midwest in the summer. And those are more northwest, east, and east-west migrations as opposed to north-south. But we also have altitudinal migration. There's a lot of birds in Tahoe that if it's a mild winter, they're up here. But if it starts to get bad, they drop down over the uh, Carson Range, down into the Carson Valley, the Washoe Valley, and we'll uh, sit things out there. They might also go down into the Sacramento Valley. So like I said, it's complex. It's not as straightforward as it seems at first. But, and I put this map up here just to show with Tahoe here and birds popping over into some of these valleys in here and also into the Sacramento Valley. And there's a lot of birds that spend the winter in the Central Valley and the coastal range of California because it's so mild compared to other places, whereas most of the rest of their species are migrating down into Mexico and South America. So when do we start getting our migrants? Well, some of them start to show up in March. If it's a mild winter, they might show up in February. Um, but but for the most part, they're really starting to show up in May. So we might get a few individuals earlier in March and April, but May is when a lot of those individuals are showing up, and we start to see things around. And June is when those really kind of level off, and actually we start to get a couple species that have already bred elsewhere, uh, maybe down lower down in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, or from up north, and they're starting to show up to Tahoe already. So, but that's also, they're moving around because they're following the food sources once again. Oh, when do they leave? Well, it depends on what they eat a lot. A lot of the birds that come up here to eat insects, towards the end of summer, our insects are starting to, to peter off. There's not as many around. So a lot of those migrants start to leave in August, even more of them in September. But the birds, like little sparrows that we have that are eating seeds, those seed resources are available through the fall. They're not covered by snow. They're going to stick around possibly through December. But if we have a lot of snow showing up early in the season, they might take off a little earlier.
And what are these birds facing? What are the struggles they have when they're on their way to Tahoe? Um, and I found this great picture. Um, but uh, cats, I, I imagine some of you guys have cats, and I have no problem with cats, but cats outdoors actually kill millions and millions of birds in North America every year. So the best thing that cat owners can do is keep your cats indoors, and that helps birds, but it also helps cats. If studies have been done, that your cat can live up to three times longer if it's indoor cat versus outdoor cat. So there's benefits all around on that one. But uh, some of the other things they're facing is loss of habitat. So if you imagine these small birds flying from Costa Rica, somewhere in Central America, and they're going a few hundred miles a night, well, let's say they come across a huge swath of land that's been cleared. There's no more forest for them to land in. They have to fly even further to try to survive, which stresses them out even more. And these birds are putting on about 20 to 30 percent more body weight before they leave the tropics to fly north. So if you imagine a 100-pound person gaining 20 to 30 pounds in a matter of two, three weeks, and then losing it all in a matter of a few weeks as well. But other things they face are predators, like this is our, a Cooper's hawk there, the type of accipiter that eats birds. So they have to face predators, but also, it was talking about the snakes, um, rodents, um, other things that are out there that they have to be wary, watchful of. And when they're landing, they're exhausted. So they don't have as much energy to escape from predators. They also have to worry about weather. If they hit a weather front, it's going to be even harder for them to move further north. Um, some good examples of that are a few birds will have to go to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and fly across the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a, um, I think it's the ruby third hummingbird that actually takes a day and a half to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. And if they hit a headwind, they're not going to make it. But if it's favorable conditions, they arrive on the breeding grounds three to three and a half days before the birds that went around the Gulf of Mexico, taking five to six days. So weather considerations play into this as well. And then we've thrown in a myriad of other things that birds have to avoid. Windows, birds hit lots of windows and a lot of them don't survive. Um, towers, radio towers, birds run into towers and die. Uh, wind turbines, um, especially with hawks. Hawks are, I mean, the early wind turbines locations were actually along hawk migration routes and so a lot of hawks die. They're getting better at placement, but there's still a lot of bat deaths, bird deaths and bat deaths that occur from wind, uh, wind farms. And then skyscrapers and cities, lights actually attract birds. It's the same thing with the towers, the flashing lights draw birds in. Sometimes birds will end up circling those lights and exhaust themselves. So a few challenges that we throw in there as well. Well, so how do these birds know when to migrate? There's a thing called photoperiod, which is just how much daylight is there. There's not much variation down in some places in the tropics, but there's enough for the birds that have hormones kick in that give them the desire to migrate. And there's a, somebody in Germany coined this phrase called Zugenhu, which means uh, restless migration. Um, so what they found is in Europe, back in the 1800s, people who were collecting wild birds would have them in cages, and right about sunset, all the birds would go to the same corner of their cage. And they'd be facing the same direction. And so they eventually figured out that this has to do with migration. That those birds, the hormones have kicked in, and they want to take off and head to where the rest of their species are going. So this right here is called an inland funnel. And then the nice graphic there, there's an ink pad in the bottom of this funnel. And the birds are placed in the bottom of it. And then there's a screen placed over the top. And those birds step on the ink pad and then walk up the side of the funnel and they leave prints showing what direction they would like to migrate. And that's a genetical, genetics, it's programmed that way. And here's a picture from the top so you can see this bird pointing off that direction. Um, well, and then, well, how do the birds know which direction to go? Well, a lot of it's genetics. They are programmed um, to know which way to go. So if you're a hawk, hawks tend to migrate during the day because they get thermals and strong winds, and they use those winds to soar. So hawks will actually have cues 
from the sun and different things that they use to follow distinct paths. Our, mo our little songbirds that we get up here mostly migrate at night. So the reason they do that is it's usually a lot calmer at night. It's also cooler, so they won't overheat. And so they're actually shown that they can uh, navigate based on star position. But they also have a thing called magnetite, which is magnets, a little bit of magnetic um, inside cells that comes from actually a um, bacteria. And that bacteria will be drawn towards different points. And so birds will use that as a magnetic compass. So, but there's also things like birds will do, they'll fly, you know, have it programmed, I'm going to fly this direction for three hours, then turn left. And then they fly that direction for a while, then they turn right. But they've shown that uh, um, bar-tailed goblets from New Zealand can fly 6,000 miles straight to the border of China and North Korea and hit a wetland dead on. So, some really cool migration stuff there. But, that's enough for migration on this because we have other things to get into, but migration could be a whole semester lecture. <laughs> Before we get into some of our specifics, I wanted to give you guys an overview of how to read a range map. So I can include a range map so that we can see where these birds are wintering and where they're ending up in addition to top. But so if we look here, the purple is year round. So there's a couple of spots like Florida and Baja, California where you can find ospreys year-round. This orange color is where they go in the summer. So most of these individuals are moving way north. And then winter brings with the uh, wintering grounds. So a lot of wintering grounds, you can see actually a little bit of uh, Central Valley, California, the Bay Area. But most of these guys are moving down into South America. And then the yellow is migration. So Outside of the migration season, you wouldn't expect them to be in the Midwest. But sometime in the spring and sometime in the fall, it's possible to see ospreys flying across the Midwest. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, cool. So, our first migrator is ospreys. Uh, frequently mistaken for bald eagles in the Tahoe Basin. They do have a white head, but if you look right here, they have a little brown eye mask there. And also, you can see they have a lot of white underneath, whereas our bald eagles have a white head and white tail. So, they have a lot of ospreys, and there's, I forget how many nests there are around the basin, but there's a lot of nests. They have a big nest on top of trees, and so a lot of times people would drive by and see a white head on top of a big nest, and think it's a bald eagle. But most of the time it's an osprey. There are a couple eagles that occasionally nest in the top of the basin. But, there's studies done that ospreys are able to catch fish in one out of every four attempts. So circling over ponds, lakes, every one to four dives, one out of four dives, they'll catch a fish. There's, they track some individuals are up to 70% of fish. And they say that they average a dive about every 12 minutes. So something I read said, if you're a fisherman, think of how efficient they are compared to you. <laughs> but also, they have this outer toe right here. Most birds have three toes forward, one back. There's, there's variation on that. But ospreys, unlike other hawks, actually the outside toe is a little bit more movable so that they can put it towards the back end and more efficiently grab onto fish. So if we look here, he's using that side toe there. It's pointing backwards. And then when they catch fish, they'll actually turn them and point them aerodynamically forward so they can fly this. <laughs> and there's places where they, they do uh, hawk watches. And I've heard of people saying, like, I was on this ridge, I swear there was no lake for 50 miles anywhere, no water source, nothing. And I see an osprey migrating overhead carrying a fish. Wow. Um, but I also have the call of what these guys sound like. I mean, one of the best places to find an osprey, I found, is a Spooner Lake. There's usually one or two circling over the lake there, so it's a great spot. And they're frequently fishing over the lake, so a good chance you'll see one dive into the water and catch one. So, our next bird. Our rufous hummingbird is the longest migrator in the world by size. 
So these birds are three inches long, and then some of them migrate down here in Mexico <coughs> up to southeast Alaska. A move of 3,600 miles. And if you put it into body lengths, 78.5 million body lengths that these rufous hummingbirds are flying from South Mexico to um, Southeast Alaska. There's a bird called an Arctic tern that actually migrates between 40 and 45,000 miles in one year. But their one-way migration is about 11,000 miles, which comes out to about 51 million body lengths for them. They're about 13 inches long. So based on size, right here in Tahoe, we get one of the longest, uh, the longest migrants by size. Now these guys, as you can see, their breeding range is actually north of here. They breed in the Cascades up into this, uh, the northern part of the Rockies. So they're at a very early migrant. It's to March and April. They start moving up the coast of California and Oregon to go to their breeding grounds. And by now, actually, in the next week or so, we'll probably start to see the males. So the males do their thing, they mate, and then they take off and leave the female to take care of the young. So, but the, they'll be migrating back down through the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada, and so we'll see them soon. Um, so, oh, and also, <laughs> they're um, frequently a hummingbird. People are quite a hummingbird feeders. This is one of the frequent visitors to a hummingbird feeder, and they're also known as one of the feistiest birds year round. They will chase off every other hummingbird, no matter what size it is, from the hummingbird feeder. Um, you know, if you're going to have people say, I have this one bird that just won't let any hummingbird come to my feeder. Well, it's most likely a rufous hummingbird, and they've actually been known to chase chipmunks away from their nest as well. <laughs> but one thing about this rufous hummingbird is you can see there's orange here and orange on the side. Um, the iridescent throat feathers are called a gorget. And that gorget, if it gets the right light, shines brightly. But if it doesn't, they turn, it turns dark. It will look black, so they don't stand out all the time. And here's a, pic a better picture. You've seen that rufous, the orange color on the side there. And then there's a female down the lower left. So she does not have this. She's green. She's got a little bit of that orange buffiness to her, but not quite the same. And I tried to get a video. I found an awesome YouTube video, but it wouldn't let me embed it in the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, but hummingbirds actually are able to fly. They're the only or hover. They're the only bird that can truly hover. Um, there's other birds that will hover in place, but hummingbirds can move forwards, backwards, and side to side, up, down, all around. And the way they do that is they actually make a figure eight pattern with their wings. It's very subtle, but they move their wings forward and flip them upside down and backwards. And so they're actually using both surfaces of their wings to be able to fly. So the humming noise is the wings. And that's them calling. And hummingbirds don't actually sing a song. They're not a songbird. So they have call notes, but they get their name from the humming noise that their wings make. And in Tahoe, we also have the smallest long distance migrant in the world. This is our smallest bird in North America, the Calliope hummingbird. And it's, um, we'll get to a couple, a couple examples of warblers in a little bit. But they're about one third the weight of our smallest warblers. So very small, about two to three grams, which is the equivalent of two to three dollar bills. So not very much weight at all. But these guys make their way from down in south of Mexico as well, up to the Sierra Nevada and some of the Keys Cascades in the Rockies for breeding. Um, and these guys are tiny, but they have, you can see their gorget there is actually streaked. So there's other hummingbirds that have solid uh, gorgets, but these guys actually have a bit streaked, and it'll, sometimes they'll stick out to the side. They're very cool looking. And here you can see the female next to him. And she also has that buffy kind of rufous color that the female hummingbird had, of the rufous hummingbird. So female hummingbirds can be very difficult to identify. So um, 
sometimes I sit on a bird identification panel with the Hahn Audubon Society, and um, it's April they do it. But um, sometimes people will submit photographs of hummingbird females, and everybody else in the panel will be like, I don't know, it's a female hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is what they sound like. I don't know if you can hear that in the back. Yeah, sorry about that. But, all right. Oh, and I should say, these guys are actually, they do nest up in the top. So these, these guys are nested here, they're already here in, um, this place, you guys know Taylor Creek down in South Lake Tahoe? There's a meadow across the way there that I found a bunch of these guys in. There's a few good spots for them around the basin. But this is one of my favorite summer migrants to Tahoe. And you can see that we also liked it at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. <laughs> um, but these guys all go down into Mexico and Central America, and then they cover a wide area of the West. And they come from a group of birds called tanagers, which actually, uh, it used to be like 230 species within that family of birds. But they've broken it up a bit, so there's not quite as many, but there's still a lot of tanagers. But, most of the tanagers are not migratory, um, so they stay down in Central and South America. But we have two others that are regular to the United States that are, show up on the East Coast. There are summer tanager and um, scarlet tanager. But this guy actually migrates the furthest north. So look up here, getting up into the Northwest Territory and um, further north. So the other tanagers, the furthest north they get is about right here. So. Um, but these guys start showing up around May, and in the tropics, these guys are mostly eating. There's the speaker. We couldn't get oh. to work. <laughs> um, in the tropics, these guys are mostly eating fruit. Um, <laughs> but our western tanagers primarily eat insects, so they're coming up here to eat insects as well. And these guys, they're brightly colored. I would think they would stand out very well, but they actually can be quite challenging to find in a tree because they're typically 20, 30 feet and up in a tree. So you have to look up. Even though they have that bright yellow and red, it surprisingly blends in well with pine trees. Um, and there's one thing, I can't remember the name of but the red pigment on the head is actually not produced by the bird. I have to look up the name of this. It's called a rhododendron, and they get it from the insects they eat, which they believe the insects get from the plants that they eat. Mm -hmm. So it's just like the pink flamingos, it's the, the food that they're eating that gives them that color. So the, the other tanagers in the east have red colors, but it's not the same red. They can actually produce that pigment themselves, whereas our western tanagers has to find the food source that gives them that bright red. And sometimes, you know, there'll be less red on the, on the head. Sometimes that red will come back even further. So there's a lot of variation in how much red they have on the head. And sometimes, and a lot of birds, as the females get old, they actually will start to produce a little bit more testosterone. And um, because of that, they can, an old female can start to show a little bit of red on the head as well. But our females are a lot grabber. They have that coloration, where they have the yellow, but it's just not bright. They have kind of a silvery gray on the belly, and that allows them to more easily blend into the nest. And actually, I want to point out that Will Richardson, the other co-founder and co-executive director of uh, Tom Institute, uh, took that picture there. It's a good picture. We use it a lot. <laughs> but the songs of these birds actually sounds like two other migrants we have to Tahoe. So we have our American Robin, our black-headed grosbeak, and our western tanager. So we'll play each song to see the slight difference between each one. Robin first? Yeah, go ahead and start with Robin. You've probably heard that. See it all throughout town. Uh, it's running around along right now and everything. The robins are around. And then black headed grosbeak. So 
a little bit faster, a little bit more whistly, but out in the field, without having both of them singing by side by side, it's similar enough that it makes you think. And then, so it's like a faster robin, shorter song. But that little at the end is a good way to tell the difference. But so one way, another way too is these guys will typically be singing higher up in the trees. The robins maybe low down in the trees or from the ground. And then black-headed grosbeaks like riparian habitat or being next to streams and rivers. So the village green is a place where you can catch all three of these guys singing. But there's at least two pairs, well maybe two pairs of black-headed grosbeaks out of the village green. But again, it's got those bright colors, not necessarily easy to see though, or easy to find. But our next one, the black-headed grosbeak. You can see another bird that spends most of the time in the west, again goes down to central Mexico, and then migrates back up to here. And some of them do stay year-round down there. And one of the things about the black-headed grosbeak is in the wintertime, they actually winter in the mountains where monarch butterflies are. And they're one of the few birds that can eat monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies are poisonous. So the way they get around that is they'll eat some butterflies, and then they'll wait eight days, presumably to let the toxins pass out of their body, and then they eat them again. So it's an eight-day cycle that they go through eating the monarch butterflies in the winter. And actually, they get their name gross speaking. You can see the size of the bill on that guy. Gross, uh, gross beak is in German for big beak. So, so large be beaks on these guys. And you see here, the females look quite a bit different. They don't have the bright orange or yellow. Pretty plain looking, but there's a good look at the size of that beak. So she's got a little bit of a wing bar in there and a little bit of rufous color. But a cool bird. And like I said, the village meeting is a good spot to go find them. And then our American robin. Um, so these guys, you can see, they're pretty much all over the United States all year. Um, but up here in Tahoe, if it's a mild winter, robins might hang out for the whole winter. Not this past winter, but the one before with all the snow we got. These guys are not sticking around for the winter. And a lot of people think, like, you know, where all, where'd all the robins go? Well, in the wintertime, they actually switch to eating fruit. And so they're up in the trees, they're in the bushes, they're not running around the lawn, and so they're not as readily obvious to see. So a lot of times robins are around, we're just not seeing them in the wintertime. But if it's really cold, they're probably not here. But also, some of them migrate, some don't. Um, like the Central Valley of California, they stick around all winter there but some of them move around. So where do our birds go? They're going down to like the Washoe Valley, Carson Valley. Maybe they're going down to the Central Valley in California. Anybody else want to see And here's what a juvenile looks like. And I've already seen a few juvenile robins around, so you might be able to see these. So if you see a funny looking robin, it's a juvenile. Who's <laughs> funny? All right, we're moving more into some of the classical migrants. This is what a lot of people think of when we think of migration warblers. So these are what we call wood warblers. They're small to medium songbirds. Um, and these guys are very active. They're usually bouncing around bushes, bouncing around trees. It can be hard to get your binoculars on them if you're trying to see them. Um, they, a lot of them have bright colors, a lot of yellow. You can see them, some of them don't have too much yellow in them. But these guys are insectivores. So they're eating insects. You see these um, tweezer-like bills that they have, which are good for catching bugs. And they have a, usually about six warblers that breed in the Tahoe Basin, but we have a few that migrate through as well. But one of our, uh, this guy actually is here in the summer, but this is actually this winter, he spent all winter in Tahoe Basin. So some of the individuals stay here all through the winter. It's the hardiest of our warblers. These guys can actually, gee, I can't remember, I can never remember the name of the berries, but they can eat berries that are waxy. 
Um, and they're called bayberries and wax myrtles. And that allows them to stay further north than a lot of our smaller warblers. But very colorful. They've got the yellow rump, which uh, a lot of birds refer to them as butter butts. <laughs> but they actually have five different yellow markings, and one on the rump, two on the sides, on the throat, and on the top of the head there. In the winter time, or in the summertime, these, the males are brightly colored. They have their best uh, plumage on. And in the west, we get what's called the Audubon race. It has a yellow throat. In the east, most of the uh, yellow rump warblers actually have a white throat and are referred to as Myrtle's race. So, and they sing slightly different songs as well. But females are not quite as bright as males, but in the wintertime, the males actually are not as brightly colored. They look a lot like the females. So in the wintertime, you can't tell the difference between the sexes, but in the summertime, you can. And you guys have probably heard this song through the forest. singing all around town right now. But they can be high up in the trees, so they can be difficult to find. And actually, the males will forage higher up in the tree than the females were. So there's, well, so there's a little differentiation in where they forage in the trees. This is a very cool migrant, uh, our yellow warbler. These guys are a little bit more riparian based. So they like to be near streams, rivers, lakes, different things like that. They'll, nest in uh, cottonwoods and different things. But you can see the male got these nice orange stripes on his breast. And these guys go down into South America, all through Central America, and cover most of North America. And the females don't have as bright of yellow, and they don't have the orange streaking on the breast. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about too is there's most of the yellow warblers are migrants, but there's a few that actually are not migratory. And these are called mangrove warblers, and they stay in places like uh, in Mexico, Central America, and they don't migrate. They stay hanging out there, but they're typically found in mangroves. Um, this is actually a picture I took in the Galapagos, and you can see in the previous picture, if we go back one slide, the male over here doesn't have that dark chestnut cap. You know, he's pretty much just kind of an olive green, maybe on the top of the head with yellow mixed in. But if we go forward, these non-migratory ones get this chestnut color on the head, and some of them <coughs> can get chestnut color all over the head. So, but here's a little side note on the non-migratory part of the species. So moving into our flycatchers, um, this is another group of birds that are typically thought of as migratory. Um, they all take off, they head south for the winter, come back north, and these again are small to medium in size, but they're not as brightly colored as our warblers. A lot of grays and browns, sometimes they get yellow washes. Um, so you can see a little bit of yellow showing up on the bottom of this guy down here. Um, and the sexes are similar. So we saw in the previous warblers that there was differentiation between what a male looks like and a female. But in the flycatchers, most species you can't tell them. So there's a few that you can. And these guys are typically found on habitat edges. So if you find a forest right next to the meadow, that's a good place to find them. Or you know, a lot of riparian habitat with willows, cottonwoods, those things next to a meadow or a forest. This working the edges, um, I guess they find, have a better chance of find, finding insects in those cases. Um, but these guys, a lot of the ones we get here in Tahoe are small, on the small side. And all three of these individuals are from a group of flycatchers called the Impidinax. And there's about a dozen species throughout the US where the best way to tell the difference between them is by their song. So if they're not singing, it's hard to tell them apart. Um, some of them have little eye rings, some don't. A lot, but these guys, a lot of times, it has to do with the length of the wing. 
the length of the tail feathers, and also the length or the coloration under the bill. So it can be very difficult to get in unless you hear that guy sing. Sometimes there's ones like a gray flycatcher that will actually pump his tail down. And so if you see a fly, an infant flycatcher sitting on a branch, pumping his tail down, that's one way to identify him. But for the most part, very challenging group of birds. But our most common flycatcher that we get to Tahoe, oh, and actually I wanted to point out that these guys all have wing bars. You have these white wing bars in here, which helps to identify them as the pit and neck flycatchers. But our western wood peewees actually don't have wing bars. So they're charcoal colored. They have a little bump to the head. And they just showed up maybe two, three weeks ago. Um, but you can see they go down into South America and then make their way up to all throughout the West. Now, an interesting thing about them is this range map here is actually an unknown. There's also an eastern wood peewee, which sounds different, um, slightly different, but when they're migrating, they don't sing, so it's hard to tell the difference. And so that range map, because they're not calling when they're in the Midwest here, they don't know where the western wood peewee and eastern wood peewee range maps stop, but they know that they're different species. No side note, but um, go ahead and play the song. Yeah. And so our western wood PV is a, the kind of wee, but the one in the east has a, where they get their name is actually pee wee, whereas ours just says the wee. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see there's not a lot of distinct markings on them. It's that little bump on top of the head, charcoal color overall. And they get a little bit of a white line on the belly if you get a look at them. But these guys are all over town as well, calling away. Um, but not the easiest to find because they are that charcoal color blends into the background and things like that. All right, moving into sparrows. Um, so these, again, are small to medium. There's, there's a theme with a lot of these birds, small to medium size. Um, but brown streaked, um, you can see some streaks showing up on this guy here. A little bit of streaking on the back of that one there. Um, they have what's called a conical bill. So this fox sparrow right here is that big conical bill, which allows them to more easily crack seeds. So our, our sparrows are all seed eaters. So these guys are warblers. All the ones we've seen, most of the ones we've seen before, are taken off at the end of summer, early fall. They're heading back because they're eating insects. But these guys are eating seeds, so they're sticking around into the fall. Um, but there's a, a lot of variation. We do have one up here called the green-tailed toby. It doesn't have the typical brown of a sparrow. But we get a few sparrows coming through. But one of the more interesting sparrows that migrates to the Tahoe area is a white-crowned sparrow. And if you look at a range map here, you can see that it shows sparrow, the white-crowned sparrow hanging out in the Tahoe area year-round. Well, we actually have two subspecies that are usually here in Tahoe. So in the winter, we have what's called the gamble, um, white-crowned sparrow. And there's a slight difference between the summer one, which is our mountain um, white-crowned sparrow. So if you look in front here, he's got white in front of his eye. This one has black in front of his eye. <laughs> it's a very subtle difference, but amazingly, they don't overlap. So our mountain white crown sparrows that come here to breed, they'll show up in like late May, early June. By August, those guys are all taken off. Mid-September to late September, our gambles white crown sparrows are showing up. And they'll stay through March or April. So, they're here close to year-round, but not quite. Um, and it's one of those things where I think only the hardcore birders get into whether it's this subspecies or that subspecies. Most people know it's a white-crowned sparrow. But here again is the mountain. Did I have that right? Yeah. The mountain with the black in front of the eye. Most likely, and I don't know if these are the exact subspecies on this, but you can see the white in front of the eye on that one. And one of the best spots to go find white crowned sparrows is up at Tahoe Meadows. These guys will be singing away all summer long. They probably haven't been up there yet, but they're probably singing. But 
through the end of August, these guys will be singing a way up there until they take off. Very common sound for toggle mode. Alright. Well, to summarize this stuff, um, there's lots of variation in migration. Like I said, it, it, it's, it's complex. It's not a, a straightforward north-south thing, but there's individuals that do that, but there's a lot of variation in the different strategies that birds use to get around. And the birds that we're getting here are migratory in the summertime. We have birds that stick around for all winter, and we actually have some birds that we only find in the wintertime up here in Tahoe. They breed further north. Um, and the reason they're coming here, most of the, the migrants, is because it's favorable breeding conditions. There's not as many competitors, there's not as many predators, there's not as many uh, nest um, parasites, and there's more food resources than they would find down in the tropics. And the reason for that is lots of insects. And uh, one thing I added in there is that these birds do make our summers a lot more colorful. We have the nice stellar jays that are that bright electric blue, but we don't have yellows in the wintertime really. So in the summertime we get the yellows and reds showing up with our migrants. And before I get into questions, just wanted to highlight a couple things we have coming up. Um, we have a, a bird walk on Saturday at the Tahoe City, Tahoe City Field Station. Um, it will be for two hours from 8 to 10. Um, where we'll hopefully find some of these migrants that I talked about in here. And actually, I did one thing I forgot to say is we have roughly 60 migrants that show up to Tahoe in the summer. So to get through all 60 would take a long time. <laughs> but um, also, we have a great crowned rosy finch bird walk up at Squaw Valley High Camp. Um, TINS members uh, get a 10% or $10 discount on the price of uh, riding the tram up. But we get uh, early access to the service tram because I think the first tram goes up at 1040, but they let us go up on the service tram so we can go out and find the birds early in the morning, which actually, that's pretty late for walk, 940. <laughs> but uh, we also have a Van Sickle Friday interpretive hike starting this summer. Um, we're partnering with the Tahoe Rim Trail to offer hikes down there from 10 to noon on uh, every Friday in July. So a great, we'll talk about birds, but we'll also talk about plants and other things, and there's actually some history topics showing up in those. And, with that, I'll answer any questions. Yes. I saw a couple um, what looked to be white pelicans on the lake. Now, where do you think they come from? They're probably coming from Pyramid Lake. Uh -huh. So our white pelicans in the winter will uh, hang out on the coast of California, but in the wintertime, I mean the summertime, they're coming inland and they're finding uh, Wizard Island from um, Pyramid Lake is where they nest. Oh. And they'll actually go travel 150 miles or so in one day looking for food, so it's not uncommon to find them flying over the lake. When, when birds fly in formation and they're flying so quickly, do they have a kind of bird radar? I mean, just like the Blue Angels or something? And then do, when, they, when one of them, do they always stay in the same position in the formation, or will, will one of the birds fly on the outside? Can they move around? Do you know? Yes, I <laughs> do. So that V formation that you're talking yeah. about, right? The lead bird is taking on the most. And actually, what is a, the tips of the wings actually create a vortex that circles as it comes off. And it's the reason why uh, airplanes have put with those winglets up on the tip. It dampens that out so that they don't get as much. But birds, um, especially ducks and geese, fly in that pattern because those little currents coming off can actually help them create lifts. So they fly close together to make it easier for them to fly. So the ones behind the lead have less effort to fly at the same speed. And what will happen is that front one will peel off after a while and go to the back when it's tired, so then a new one will move into their position. So they're rotating position as they're flying. And those ducks and geese, some of them are migrating like 35, 45 miles an hour. That's a pretty good clip. Have you seen that? Osprey teaching their young on a fish? I've not so seen that. Have you? You were talking about how the, the fish, they turn the fish. Well, I've seen down here along the lake, and uh, it's, it's kind of funny to watch the young, because when they take, they finally take the young on the fish, and it's the male that's teaching them the fish. <clears throat> and what, the, of course, the male goes and goes in the water, and they come over the fish. 
And the young ones will dive in, of course, and they, they probably come up with something, but they don't turn the fish right away. Oh, uh -huh. well, maybe so, that is a learned behavior. And so the first time or two, they try to hang on to that fish, but they're just wobbling and screaming and, you know, just look, look like they're going somewhere in the air, just trying to control what's going on. But then they, after a couple of times, they, they learn that they turn the fish. Where, where do you see them doing it after there, there are several nests down on the shore. I think, uh, I don't know how many nests there are now, but one third, a year ago or so, there were 23 nests, or probably a little bit more than that. But you can see them, they're usually within, I don't know what, 50 feet or yards, whatever, of the, of the lake. They're pretty close to the lake. I've also, I've also noticed, by the way, that uh, uh, on one occasion watching for several days, going down and, you know, over a week's time watching the osprey nest to try to determine how many young there are. And I've, I've um, noticed because the young jump on the edge of the nest and then they jump back in. Yeah. But I've also noticed at one point, um, on one occasion, um, I was looking at the nest and I felt like I was being watched because I tried to hide. And then I looked over and there was an eagle. And I, and I heard or read the one that the eagles try to steal the fish that the osprey catch. Yeah, actually, um, one time I had a group of kids up at Spooner Lake, and we got to watch an osprey circle the lake and then catch a fish. And he started taking off to the north, and just then a bald eagle flew in. Right. And started chasing him and harassed him until he dropped the fish. The bald eagle caught the fish in midair and then took off. <laughs> Eagles are crooks. Yeah, well, Benjamin Franklin actually had issue with us having a bald eagle as the symbol of the United States because he called him a thief. <laughs> um, you know, because bald eagles, they, they will hunt their own food, but if they have an easy way to snack something, they'll take it. Yes. Could you comment about the uh, bird uh, stability and uh, variation population wise? Bird stability, I mean, that's a huge. Uh, I, I notice uh, there seem to be times when there are a lot of uh, some species of bird around there, there are other times. When yeah, well, you know, like last summer, um, it seemed like a lot of our migrants showed up to the basin for like a week or so, and then they took off and went elsewhere. A lot of birds didn't nest in the basin last year. And just because we had so much snow, there wasn't, weren't as many resources for them. Um, so um, without knowing specific birds, they, there's a tremendous variation um, within that. And, um, I don't know how to answer that a little more, unless you have a more specific. Well, I just wonder if, you know, are, are the number of birds in North America rising, declining, holding steady? Some species, species going up, other species going down? There's all the above. So overall, um, a lot of our migrants are actually having problems. Um, it's not just their summer places where they need habitat. They also need habitat in their wintering grounds, which a lot of Central America, South America being turned into plantations, palm plantations, different things. Um, some islands in the Caribbean have a lot of hunting practices. So they'll kill the migrants that come through. So. A lot of the migrants are facing problems, and you know, that also is their stopping grounds. Uh, some birds have specific spots where they stop, and so if they lose that habitat in that little spot, they're not going to do well. But are there birds that are doing well with the presence of humans? Yes, like red-tailed hawks have done very well with the presence of humans. Um, but you know, there's things like sage grouse where you know we're tearing up the sage, we're putting in solar panels, uh, different things, ranches, converting the sagebrush into ranches and those things that take away from their habitat so uh, sage grouse are actually declining. So um, 900 birds to choose from to, to look at, but some increasing, a lot stable, but also a lot that are decreasing. With insects, sometimes that orange color is a sign of I'm toxic. Is that uh, true with birds as well, or is it just an attractant somehow? No, you know, um, birds have those bright colors as, as attractive. You know, the males put on their best clothes to attract the females, but they're also looking to tell other males, this is my spot. Mm -hmm. Are the hummingbirds here now? Yes, calliope hummingbirds are here. Um, I have not heard any reports of rufous hummingbirds yet. So rufous hummingbirds should be showing up any day now, though. They okay. typically start showing up mid-June to late June. We're out at South Lake Tahoe, out by the Y, there by the high school. Do you know if um, the Kalaipi hummingbirds are out in that area? Yeah, if you go to Taylor Creek, mm -hmm. um, not Taylor Creek itself, but there's um, 
it's the road you take into Fallen Leaf Lake. And then there's some meadows there on the si on both sides. If you just were to get out and walk along there and get off the road just a little ways, it's a good chance you'll run across a couple of uh, mm -hmm. Calliope hummingbirds in there. Now, will they come to the feeders? I just put out a hummingbird feeder. And no. I'm, I'm, I'm from Southern California, and we're out vacationing for a couple of weeks. So I wanted to see if I could see the Calliope. Yeah, you know, um, I think all hummingbirds come to feeders, so if you put one out and they find it... Yeah, I just yeah. put it out yesterday. Yeah, it might take them a little while. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then if you take it down, they might get angry. <laughs> if, you take, if you take it down and don't put it out, like a lot of people... Um, one thing that I will suggest is uh, that you take it down every night so bears don't find it. Yeah. Oh, really? So oh, yeah. put it out in the morning, take it down in the evening, right. and that'll limit the opportunity for bears to find it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, but a lot of hummingbirds get used to, well, hey, you put the hummingbird feeder yeah. out and you haven't. I've heard of hummingbirds staring in people's windows. And <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have that where I live in Long Beach. I live right by Long Beach State. And um, they get the Allens. The Allen's hummingbird is coming regularly. There's a little nest behind our, on our patio, and our neighbor, she showed me, just as we were leaving, there's, she said it comes over to my feeder and back to the nest. Oh, cool. And they do come to the window and look in. Yeah. You know, they don't, oh, they're worth my food. Yeah. Thank you. Those birds that get the red faces and heads, you say, from what they eat, now, do the females and males eat different things? Because the females don't get their redheads. I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's one of those things where genetically the males are dis predisposed to get that red color, whereas the females are not. And actually because um, the, if you get a really old female, that testosterone, to testosterone will kick in and they'll start to produce it. So it, it might have something to do with the presence of testosterone or not. You know, because a juvenile male will not have that red head as well. So a lot of a lot of these birds actually the males will look like the females their first year, maybe their first two years. How long do they live? How long do they live? Um, oh actually I was going to talk about that with Robins. Um, here's a, a a year in the life of a robin. Uh, they nest about forty percent of nests will be successful in raising young. Of those, 25% of those young will make it to November. Mm. Then, come January 1st, of all the robins we have in the United States, half will not make it to the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so, but on average, um, every six years, it's, there's a, new, a whole new generation of robins out there. Um, but robins can live up to 14 years. Uh, Black-headed gross beaks, I think the oldest on record was like 11 years. Um, tanagers like 10 years. So uh, the little warblers, a little bit less. It might be like two, three years average, but with a long-lived individual being like five or six years old. Um, but you know, hummingbirds actually, I think, can live pretty long. Um, but you know, an osprey can get into like 15, 20 years old. Yeah. Um, California condors can get into their 50s. The blue jay. Huh? The blue jay. Uh, the stellar jay that we have here? Yeah. You know, I don't know how old they would, but I would suspect they're living five to six years, an older individual getting to that 10 to 12 year range probably. Because I have some that are really mad at me because I moved the bird feeder. So I figured they must have been here last year. And they talk to each other. So the jays, jays are from a, a family of birds called the corvids that includes ravens, crows, magpies, uh, our nutcrackers here. And they're actually considered one of the smartest groups of birds. Um, Ravens, they've shown, can have up to 47 different calls that they use to communicate with each other. Um, so it's possible that they're passing it on <laughs> through communication. That, like, hey, there's a feeder here, and then they show up. Where's the feeder? <laughs> well, they come back to a nest if, if they've made a nest. We've got a J nest under the par eaves, and, and they, they left, and then, you know, nothing happened this year. And I don't know, will they come back if they've... So they might, if, if their nest didn't work, um, they might have gone to a different location and built another nest. So a lot of birds, if their nests don't make it, um, if it's early enough in the season, they'll make a second nest. Um, some birds won't, but so there's a good possibility they went elsewhere to make a nest. So but, and no other bird will see that nest and say, hey, 
you know, I want to live there. No, nope. that's oh. it. Well, you know, a nest building is typically part of the mating ritual. So building a nest like that, a, a pair will get together, then they'll make their nest, or maybe the female will make the nest, but it's part of the mating ritual. So for a lot of those cup nesters, they're making a new nest every year. Um, woodpeckers also make a new cavity every year. But things like bluebirds, swallows, chickadees are cavity nesters as well, but they can't make a cavity. So they will actually use abandoned woodpecker nests for their nest, and they'll go back to the same one or a different one. So this year, oh, I'm sorry. Well, this year I saw a bird look just like a robin, no red breast though, but it spent the winter and it was in our mountain ash and was eating some kind of dehydrated berries. Do robins ever knock down a red breast? Was it gray? It was gray. It was all gray. So it's um that was most likely a Townsend solitaire, which is also a thrush, which is the family of birds that robins are from. Uh huh. And they'll stick around through the winter, and they're actually known for um, singing song in the wintertime. Most birds only sing in the summertime when it's mating season, mm -hmm. but they'll sing songs in the wintertime because they'll typically find a juniper tree and defend it for the whole winter. Mm -hmm. So they have a continuous food source. Townsend's um, fresh. Townsend's solitaire. And solitaire. They're gray overall, and they'll have a little bit of orange in the wings. Uh -huh. Yes. This may be a stupid question, but we have a pair of stellars. We, we think they make, they make the life or something, right? We have this very, very thick bush, like a seed, <coughs> and they come back, and they did come back again this year. And it, it's really a wonderful thing to see mom come in through all of this thickness and come in and dad and things and everything. But we never could figure out, I think the day we when we got that, that freak snow, the other time, then the mom and dad look like they left, and we can't get up inside to see. Now, this may be stupid, but we never can figure out how does this little bird come through all this foliage? Do they, do, do, do mom and dad help them out of the nest? No, they'll get out of the nest on their own. On their own. Yeah, they'll just hop through the branches, and it, it's amazing the tight spaces that birds can actually fly through, like, um, that accipiter, the Cooper's hawk that I showed you guys, um, there's actually a, we have a, a northern goshawk here, which is the same family of hawks, and I've seen footage of them where they'll fly through a gap that wide. So they'll come in, they'll tuck their wings and turn to the side and fly through. So birds are amazing at getting through tight little spaces. Mm -hmm. I think they seem to have kind of wrecked the nest this time. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but also, you know, I'm, it's one of those things where, you know, people say, oh, I've had the same birds come to my house for like 10 years. Well, it's impossible to know without banding them and be, or being a way to identify the individuals like this one's never had the feather there or, you know, a stellar that has a white feather on the head. You can tell that. But if they don't have a feature that stands out, without marking them some way, it's just impossible to know if it's the same individuals every year or new individuals because if it's a good nesting location, there's a good chance another individual will find it if that one is not going back to it. Thank you. Um, we live in uh, Indianapolis, New York, Indianapolis, uh, most of the year. And when it's migration in the fall and then in the spring, um, downtown Indianapolis will put all the, you know, as many lights out as they can to stop birds from flying into the building. And I was wondering, do you know of any other like big cities that will are doing that so birds aren't flying? And they also counted it. If a, a bird flies, ex except if it's like a um, starling or something like that, but a migrating bird, if they find a dead one, they call the um, naturalist and tell them what kind of bird it was. Yeah, you know, I know there's organizations that are tracking that, and um, I know there's more examples in Indianapolis, but I can't think of any specific ones. But um, but there are uh, cities that do that in the spring and the fall. Mm -hmm. In the peak of migration, they ask everybody to turn off the lights to make it safer for the migrants to get through. You know, and, and one of the challenges, too, with you know windmills and buildings and towers 
if birds hit them, you know, there's lots of predators and scavengers out at night. So they're picking all those things up before we get to them and find them. But, um, but there are enough left over where people are getting data of like, this species is more likely to run into buildings than that species. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, during this last winter, we had the name of it, the chickadee. Um, and oh, the cystic uh, chickadee. Oh, yeah. This was partial, partial of my notion. Yeah, well, there's, there's millions of birds out there. There's bound to be some with mutations. And actually, well, that's how life continues on, right? We keep mutating. I've also noticed that the chickadees, they're near, up here we call Chickadee Ridge. Yep. And people hike up there. And um, I'm convinced that the birds know when the tourists are there. If you can go up on a weekend, and they'll be, you know, you're here in the trees, and they'll, they'll light in your hands or hat, whatever. Um, but you go up on a weekday and they're like, <laughs> It's possible. I mean, the, the bear's no trash day, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what kind of owls do we have here in Tahoe? We have a lot of owls. The Sierra Nevada are known for owls. Um, <coughs> we have great horned owls. We have pygmy owls, sawwit owls, flammulated owls, barn owls, uh, spotted owls. I'm probably missing one or two. In there. We have one that lands in a tree outside our window. You know, I can't identify him because I can hear him, but I can't see him. Yeah, a lot of times they're, they're easier to hear at night than they are to find. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, so there's at least six different owls that we have in Tahoe. Okay. okay. Yep. You were mentioning that some some species or some members of one species population stay somewhere and will not migrate will not follow with the others. Is that, um, is that still considered the same species then, or do you see a trend where a species will actually develop away from a species? Like, like the warblers, they tend to look already different maybe? But, um, yeah, well, so for example, robins. Um, I'm going to try to make sure I get your question answered, but the Central Valley of California, there's non-migratory robins in there. But you go north to Oregon, there's ones that migrate from Oregon to Southern California, ones from Washington that migrate to Mexico, ones from Canada that migrate even further south of Mexico. So there's that whole range, and that's one strategy for the robins. Uh, the warblers, like the yellow warbler, all of those guys are taken off pretty much. Um, but if we get things like some of the populations not migrating while others are, it's definitely possible if conditions are favorable that they continue to diverge and they'll become separate species. So there's a good chance that the mangrove yellow warblers will turn into their own species at some point when they determine they're not interbreeding. Have, have, have you seen that already with certain species before in the past where, where, where science decided, well, this is now a new species because of that migration pattern? Has um, it happened before? Or? I'm sure it has. You know, um, there's an organization called the American Ornithological Union, and they're the one that's in charge of naming all of our birds. And they do, um, it, there's, there's what there's called lumpers and splitters. There's people that like to lump species together to make them one, and there's people that like to split them into many different species. Like um, one of our common uh, sparrows in the Tahoe Basin is the dark-eyed junco, which is usually here year-round. Sometimes they'll take off if it's a bad winter, but we have the Oregon subspecies. Um, there's also slate-colored, which don't have the chestnut sides and the white belly. They're pretty much just charcoal-colored. Um, there's also pink sided, there's also orange. Or, so they all look different, but they're still shown to interbreed. But they, at, at one point, they were all different species, and now they're back to being one species. And, you know, whatever the conditions are, we might push them towards separating, but there's also things that could push them back towards staying intermingled. It's a, that's, a, that's not another easy question to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Could you back up to the screen before so we can see the activities again? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe one more question? Uh, my friend was visiting and she does bird surveys in the eastern, in eastern North America. She swore what she thought was indigo bunting. She just heard it out here. But she then thought, no, no, it can't be indigo bunting. Is there anything that might have sounded similar to that? Or could it have been an you indigo bunting? I don't know what an indigo bunting sounds like. But there's um, what we call vagrants. 
uh, birds that get off course. Um, one thing with migration also is, uh, you know, I talked about there's a genetic component to knowing where to go. Well, imagine you have that 360 degree compass and you're off by one degree. And then you migrated 3,000 miles. You're going to end up pretty far off from where you intended to go. Um, so there's individuals that just have that. Um, I was just leading a birding tour in Oregon and we found an orchard <coughs> oriole that should be found anywhere west of the Rockies. Um, so there's these individuals that get lost for whatever reason. They're young. Uh, they hit a storm and got blown off course. So is it possible? Yes. In, um, I'm trying to, I, I can't recall any records that I know of indigo buntings around, but it's possible. Okay, okay with that, I, I will give Will, sorry, Kirk, a round of applause. <laughs>